All right, so welcome to the next topic. Um, for this lecture, I would like to talk a bit about uh, code quality. And this um, splits up into three subtopics. One is actually metrics for code quality. So how do we measure the quality of software in general? Then the other topic is so-called code smells. These are um, issues in the code that are not errors in themselves, but rather issues that may cause future errors, for example. And last but not least, anti-patterns, which are just like the, the design patterns we discussed previously, common solutions for common problems that are, however, kind of uh, going to cause other issues down the road, so that are not the ideal solution. Um, first of all, let's have a look at what attributes we can actually uh, use to describe the quality of software. So there's um, quite a number of them, safety and security, um, resilience and related topics, um, understandability and learnability, uh, usability also, this is kind of the user facing aspect, then uh, reusability and portability, this is the maintenance aspect. Um, related to that is also uh, modularity and complexity. This also has an influence on how well software can be maintained. And um, last but not least, how efficient the software actually is and uh, how well it, it can be, be validated, how well the efficiency can, for example, be tested actually. And in this um, lecture, we're going to focus mainly on these attributes. So um, how well can I, can I reuse and adapt the software? How well can I actually understand it also? Um, this is kind of uh, related to the previous block, but um, for example, code smells actually have an influence on understandability too. So, but the main focus will, uh, will be on these attributes. <coughs> So first of all, let's talk about what metrics we can uh, use to measure the quality of software. So on the one hand, of course, we have the functional quality. And this is kind of what we've been doing all along in our test cases, for example. So we have uh, functional requirements, which can actually be tested. We have specifications, which we can um, build test cases for. And so we have our uh, our test suits, and um, well, when they when they perform correctly, then we know that we have uh, met all the requirements that the tests have been designed for at the very least. So this is often called dynamic analysis because it happens at runtime while the program is running. Uh, it's uh, going to perform the tests. Um, on the other side, we have the structural quality, and this is more related to the non-functional requirements, like the ones we talked about previously. Um, how maintainable is the software, uh, how robust, how modular, and so on. And for this, we don't need to actually run the software. The, if, uh, therefore, this is also called static analysis. So this happens just on uh, uh, on the foundation of looking at the code, basically. So either this can be done through a code review where somebody else will have a look at your code. Um, similar to what happens in pair programming where uh, two people are on the same computer and one of them is writing the code and the other one is basically looking at it and reviewing it on the fly. So this also already improves the structural quality of the code. And there are also so-called lint checkers, which are tools that are designed to specifically check for common issues in the code that are not specifically errors, that won't cause an exception or something like that, but which, for example, will impact uh, the readability and therefore also the, the maintainability down the road. Um, when we talk about uh, code quality metrics, another thing we should keep in mind is that we basically shouldn't overdo it with the metrics. Um, so, uh, especially if you're if you're managing larger software projects or if you're working in a large project which is being managed by somebody, then. Uh, some people kind of tend to fall into the trap that and, and think that you can't manage it if you can't measure it. And this is uh, often a bit of a problem because then you start to, to overdo the whole metrics thing 
and um, maybe even build incentives based on the metrics. So see this comic for an example. Um, the problem then is that people inevitably start to optimize for the metrics because as long as the the um, the metric is uh, is good then your performance is good and then you will optimize for the metric and not actually for good software so um, and if you p p uh, pick a metric that's not very well suitable so let's say um, you, the metric is you have to write at least uh, 100 lines of code every day which is of course a stupid metric but let's say somebody picks that then uh, it's very easy to just write 100 lines of, of empty comments for example and then you have fulfilled your metric but the software doesn't actually do anything at all so for that reason be careful to to not to overdo um, measuring things there's um a quote by bill gates for example regarding metrics that uh the uh, measuring the uh, productivity of a software in terms of how how much code is there is like measuring progress on an airplane by much how it weighs by how much it weighs so this is um of, of course quite a quite a nice analogy uh it, just because a program is longer and has more source code doesn't necessarily mean it's it's in any way better because you can uh, just write uh, nonsensical statements or uh, or empty statements and all of that and uh, it will of course increase the, the size of the code and even if you write functional code then much uh, m having much more code isn't necessarily better um so uh, the only useful uh, uh, metric in terms of lines of code is to use this as, as a base for other things. Um, in most cases, uh, it's actually measured in terms of uh, logical lines of code. So each statement counts as one line, basically, and uh, all the white space and comments and so on are ignored because otherwise um, this really wouldn't make a lot of sense. So what metrics are actually kind of useful? So of course you can, for example, just uh, count the bugs uh, in, uh, in each 1000 lines of code, for example. You can look at the so-called fan in and fan out values at the um, code coverage, uh, test coverage uh, especially, and uh, also at the so-called cyclomatic complexity. So let's look at each of these metrics in turn. Um, the number of bugs per 1000 lines of code is uh, a quite interesting metric to, to look at the larger projects as a whole. So um, one very very outstanding example is software that's been built according to some specific nasa guidelines uh, if you remember um, writing software for space applications is especially hard um, and if you if you have a bug in your code then that often means that hundreds of millions of euros worth of spacecraft will will crash and burn so for that reason it's very important to to keep the number of bugs very low and for uh, these uh, nasa software uh, development guidelines you get something like 0 0.1 bugs for every 1000 lines of uh, of actual code but of course the the development process uh, if you follow these nasa guidelines is very uh, very strict and uh, very involved so this is not something you can use in, in for everyday projects basically um, if you look at regular software basically then these this report which i'm citing here um, analyzed 45 open source project which had something like uh, 37 million lines of code altogether and here we had uh, something around 0 0.45 bucks for per, for each thousand lines of code so quite a lot more than this this nasa software uh, guidelines uh, result in and for the commercial software we have uh, 41 projects with something like 300 million lines of code and here we get uh, something like 0 0.64 bucks uh, per thousand lines of code so um, 
it's important to uh, keep in mind that the commercial projects here are almost uh, 10 times as large as the open source software. So uh, these numbers on, uh, by themselves don't really uh, mean that open source software has fewer bugs. Um, it's just that uh, open source software is generally smaller in terms of, of total project size. And this also contributes, of course, to, to having fewer bugs. So the larger the code base is, the easier it is to, to introduce new bugs. And for that reason, uh, the slightly higher number in commercial software doesn't really tell anything about the relation between open source and commercial software. But uh, in fact, the numbers are relatively close to each other. And so uh, just as a very rough rule of thumb, you can expect uh, in just about any software project, you can expect 0 0.5 bucks or something like that for each thousand lines of code. So every 2000 lines of code should will probably contain at least one bug. Um, this doesn't really say anything about the severity of the bug, of course. This is just a very rough guideline, but uh, as, an, as, as a rule of thumb of how many bugs you can expect in a specific size of code base. This is a, a, nice, a nice guideline. All right, another metric that's quite helpful sometimes is to uh, look at the so-called fan in and fan out. Um, if you draw a graph with, uh, representing which method calls which other methods, then the fan in, for example, for a specific method is um, how many other methods call that uh, uh, function x and the fan out is how many functions are called by x. Um, these are very simple um, metrics, of course, they're easy to calculate and uh, both can tell us something about the code. So if you have a, a high fan in, so a lot of other methods call x, then that means that x is a very central uh, function in the code and if you change anything in X then you may need to, to edit a lot of other places in the code. So that tells you basically that this is a, a crucial piece of code that uh, you should take care if you change it. And if you have a high fan out then that means that your method X itself uh, is probably quite complex and may benefit from being split up. So these are very simple metrics, but they can already tell you a bit about the, the overall um, maintainability of the code. Um, another metric is code coverage. This is actually a hybrid between um, the static and dynamic uh, metrics, which we already talked about. Um, and this relates to, of course, to tests, to unit tests, system tests, and so on. Um, and in general, code coverage is, uh, or test coverage is expressed as a percentage. And that means how many uh, functions in the code are uh, called during the tests, um, how many statements are executed. So if you have 100% function coverage, that means just that every function or every method in the code has been called at least once during the tests. Um, if you have 100% statement coverage, that means that every every statement in the whole code has been executed at least once during the tests. Um, the next uh, complexity level is branch coverage. 100% branch coverage means, means that every possible uh, branch uh, in, the, uh, in the code was executed at least once. This is very similar to statement coverage actually. Then um, condition coverage, 100% condition coverage means that every condition in the code was evaluated both as true and as false at least once. And um, last but not least, the most complex one is the execution path coverage. That means that every possible path through the entire code was executed at least once. And as you can imagine, it becomes progressively more difficult to uh, achieve 100% coverage for each of these. So 100% function coverage is really easy. You just have to 
call every function in your code at least once in your tests. But statement coverage is already a lot more difficult because depending on what uh, conditions you have in your code, you might uh, require quite different inputs to your individual tests. Um, this means also it's difficult to write um, black box tests that achieve, for example, full statement coverage because you already need to know quite a bit about the internals of each function um, to write tests that actually uh, provide that sort of, of coverage. But all of these uh, provide a, a, a valuable metric, um, whatever, whichever one you pick, to see how much of your code is actually tested. And it's actually not uh, not very common to um, achieve 100% uh, coverage of any of the uh, higher higher level types of coverage. So function coverage, yes, this is quite common to have 100% uh, function coverage. This is also uh, when people talk about 100% unit test coverage, then they usually mean function coverage. All the other ones are, as I mentioned, progressively more complex to achieve. Um, I already talked about uh, branches and execution path, and this is actually um, related to the next metric I want to mention, cyclomatic complexity. So here we have a very simple example program, which contains just a, a, a loop and uh, one branch and a couple of other statements. And um, now for this um, for each of these functions, you can uh, uh, draw a so-called control flow graph, which you see here. And I've labeled all the individual um, nodes in that graph with the corresponding line. So for example, this structure here, this tri oops, I'm sorry, <laughs> this triangular structure here represents uh, the, the for loop here. Um, the inner part of the loop is this node, and uh, as you can see, the control flow will go around that loop until the condition is no longer true and then it will continue to the next part. And here we have the evaluation of the if condition and if it's true then we will execute line 6 and in both cases we will then continue at line 8 and exit the function. So this is the so-called control flow graph and here you can also see that there are quite a number of different paths through the code. So for example, you could uh, exit the loop without actually executing it once. So for example, if in this case A is negative and you can either uh, go straight to the exit without executing the inner part of the uh, condition or you can go th uh, through the condition without executing the loop uh, depending on what um, what functions you have. So there's quite a number of different paths that you can take from the start of the function to the end. And uh, here you can also see that, um, for example, statement coverage, 100% statement coverage would include that the loop is executed at least once and the condition is executed. And then all the statements in the function have been executed. But of course, there's quite a, a additional number of execution paths. So you can have an execution path that uh, goes through the loop, but not through the condition. And you can have an execution path going through the loop and through the condition and so on. So um, here you can easily see, I think, that it's quite difficult to achieve, for example, full execution path coverage, because you need to consider all sorts of combinations, all sorts of paths that the, the control flow can take through this graph. Um, but we actually wanted to talk about the, the metric of cyclomatic complexity. Um, and this is actually related to the number of independent paths that the uh, control flow can take through the graph. Um, and there's actually a simple formula for this uh, complexity. For this, you need to count the number of edges between the individual nodes, then you need the number of nodes themselves, and you need the number of graph components. In, in this case, we just have one single graph component because it's just one function. And so we have um, nine edges, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we have eight nodes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And as I mentioned, we have one component. So we put that into the formula and get a, a complexity of three. This is actually quite low. This is a simple function after all. Um, the very rough rule of thumb is uh, if you have a larger module or a large function that has a complexity 
of 10 or higher, then you should consider splitting it up. It's also related to the to the fan out metric. So the more functions you call, um, uh, the, the more complex uh, a specific method is and the a lot more likely it is that it will be very hard to understand and to read. All right, so much for this part of regarding metrics. We'll continue in a moment.